गुड इवनिंग आई वेलकम यू ऑल एट टूडेज लेक्चर एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट डॉक्टर कार्तिक इज गोइंग टू मेक टू डेज लेक्चर ऑन पेरिया एंड आई एम वेरी प्रिवलेज टू इंट्रोड्यूस हिम डॉक्टर कार्तिक हैज रिसेंटली ज्वाइन एज असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ सोशल साइंस एज एट नेशनल लॉ स्कूल ऑफ इंडियन यूनिवर्सिटी बैंगलोर and he studied at loyola college and the uh, asian college of journalism at chennai before joining uh, pursuing a master degree in history from jawaharlal nehru university and he earned his phd in government from university of access where he was also a, a, a graduate teacher assistant and before joining the law school in bengaluru he worked as senior lecturer at the school of development azim premji university and as assistant professor of political science at triple s kolkata and mary curie research fellow at the university of welhampton he was awarded a european union mary curie action individual fellowship for his two year research pro project title freedom from caste the political thought of periyar ev rama swami in a global context and it's very prestigious i believe that one of those rare occasion when uh, this prestigious and highly competitive fellowship was awarded for research on critical indian thinker he has many uh, number of uh, publication his credit his article has appeared in many reputed international journals his first monograph was on fanon Uh, identity and resistance in which he reflect on the question of identity it was published in 2009 or by orient blackswan and his recent book uh, is on periyar uh, title as periyar a study in political atheism which again published by orient blackswan which deal with the concept of political atheism and today he is going to speak from his book so kartik i welcome you and now you can speak for 45 minute around and then we can have 20 20 minute uh, uh, question answer and i request people if they they have some question please hold them and they can ask at the end of the uh, lecture they will be allowed to uh, directly ask question from the speaker karthik street zero please dear uh, nishikant thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak at uh, csds and i consider it uh, my honor to be speaking uh, uh, today uh, at this uh, uh, remarkable research institution and to be uh, in conversation with such a prolific scholar of uh, gandhi such as yourself and uh, i also very eagerly look forward to your critical comments and the interaction that will follow my uh, presentation um <clears throat> so uh, before i start my presentation i just want to give an idea of uh, where this book is uh, coming from um <clears throat> and how uh, 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 it was uh, actually uh, written uh, you know the how and why of this uh, book uh, so uh, generally uh, i mean uh, if you if you to tamil nadu as a visitor or something you are bound to come across uh, statues of this uh, bearded man who looks like uh, you know a hindu saint or perhaps like socrates or some thinker uh, with a cane in his hand and uh, so uh, if you ask people they would let you know that uh, this is uh, periyar ev ramasamy the leader of the dravidian movement the founder of the self respect movement and many are likely to point out that uh, he was a uh, nastigan derived from nastiga and which uh, you know uh, in the archaic usage uh, nastiga uh, refers to someone who defies the authority of the vedas or does not believe in the authority of the vedas but then in a popular usage especially in south india nastiga or natiga as it is said in tamil has uh, come to refer to atheism as such 
not just a, a, a denying of the Veda, because you know there are many religious cults in India or religious movements in India which did not take the Vedas as sacrosanct. But in uh, modern or more contemporary usage, Nastigam or Nastigam in uh, Tamil vocabulary came to refer to uh, people who did not believe in any sort of uh, religion as such. And uh, one of the most uh, prominent uh, Nathigavadis or uh, atheists of the previous century was uh, Periyar E. V. Ramasam. Uh, on, his, uh, on the pedestal of many of his statues in Tamil Nadu, you are bound to come across this uh, very provocative slogan of his, uh, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. Uh, he who worships God is a barbarian. He who propagates God is a scoundrel. He who believes in God is uh, a, a thief or something of that sort. You know, these, these lines, which I mentioned in my book. So basically, uh, it, it appears that Periyar has some sort of a personal crusade against God and uh, uh, religion or more specifically Hinduism. Mm. And uh, these are some of the accusations which he has faced in his own lifetime. So he has been accused of being anti-God. He has been accused of being anti-Brahman. He has been accused of being anti-Hindu, of being anti-religion, of offending religious sentiments. And therefore, by virtue of all of these, he has also been accused of being anti-Indian. And we know how potent this charge can be in uh, certain atmospheres uh, at this moment and even at several other moments in the past. Uh, but uh, having said that, uh, what I found is that uh, not just among the, uh, uh, the general layman critique of Periyar, but even among the well-established uh, academics who encountered Periyar or uh, who had criticisms of him, they uh, tend to tended to attribute to him a sort of a crude atheism, which uh, emphasized uh, uh, rejection of religion uh, purely on on uh, a, a, a very uh, limited uh, empirical verificationist uh, basis. Um, so Periyar, as such, has been accused. Uh, uh, even by uh, well-meaning uh, uh, academics and scholars of paying too much attention to the ritual dimension of Hinduism, to paying too much attention to the characters and figures of uh, the epics and uh, of the Puranas and not paying enough attention to actual social uh, problems. Uh, so, in other words, uh, they tended to portray Periyar as a sort of an atheist who did not uh, really address the crucial social and political concerns of his time, uh, most notably, but not restricted to, the question of caste, and especially the manner in which caste affected the people who are located at the bottom most of the social hierarchy, namely the Dalits or the untouchable community. So these are sort of several, uh, uh, a summary of several criticisms which were placed on Periyar, which I encountered in my research on Periyar. But having read the primary works of Periyar, unfortunately, the majority of uh, the primary works of Periyar are in Tamil. They run to anywhere between 37 to 40 volumes. Uh, I mean, when I was doing my research, I had 37 volumes at hand, but I believe there are more and uh, some others on the way. And likewise, we still do not have a proper documentation of the private uh, correspondence of uh, Periyar uh, with his contemporaries. So as uh, intellectual historians, there is an expansive resource with which uh, we 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 uh, uh, we can trace a primary material of Periyar, but even that material is comprehensive, but not complete as such. It's not the final definitive edition 
which we can call the collected works of Periyar. So Periyar's works have been collected and collated, collected and published as the volumes of uh, Periyar Kalanjiyam by the Dravidar Karagam. And uh, uh, reading these volumes, right, I uh, was able to uh, 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 discover a thinker whose uh, atheism uh, was not just a criticism of religion, but fundamentally a criticism of social power and more specifically state power. Right. So this is uh, the topic which uh, I uh, plan to address in the course of uh, this presentation. And my main contention, atheism is a challenge to political theology. So political atheism acknowledges the unity or affinity of religion and the state, and it opposes or criticizes both. It realizes that statism relies on similar mystifications like theology and seeks to demystify the supposedly mysterious, wondrous and miraculous. It is a negative program that defies the yes of the divine and the secular sovereign. Instead, it asserts the sovereignty of the individual and their inalienable freedom. Now, as you would be familiar, the greatest theorist of political theology in the past century was the German thinker Karl Schmitt. In his work, Political Theology, Schmitt identifies the sovereign as, and I quote him, he who decides on the exception. This is probably the simplest and the most powerful definition of the sovereign which we have come across till now. And to Schmitt, sovereignty resides in determining definitively what constitutes public order and security and in determining when they are disturbed. So the sovereign decides whether a situation is normal or an exception. And anyone interested in politics must be interested in the relation between these. The parallel in theology is in the concept of good and evil, where evil is the exception to the good. And what is evil is interpreted with reference to the good of God. Or the figure of God decides the exception of evil. So if the exception in a Schmittian sense is an attempt to restore order in a political sense, then the concept of evil is an attempt to restore order in a theological sense. So Schmitt argues that the crucial concepts in the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts, both because of their historical development and because of their systematic structure. The exception and evil thus are concepts integral to ideas of political order and good. In making a powerful case for political theology, Carl Schmitt was also responding to two currents in Europe that were challenging both political and theological order, namely Marxism and anarchism. In my reading, um, I view Periyar as a thinker who is a lot closer to anarchism than to Marxism. There have been readings uh, uh, that have tried to uh, develop a Periyarist Marxism in Tamil Nadu or to have a Marxist reading of Periyar in Tamil Nadu. But what I've tried over here, which I uh, think is something new, is to read Periyar in the anarchist uh, tradition and to understand how he develops his concept of political atheism. Because in my reading, Periyar was not a liberal atheist who restricted his criticisms to religion alone. His was a political atheism that expressed disbelief in both God and state, that attacked both religious and political forms of oppression, highlighting their interlinks. So while there is evidence from history, such as uh, Periyar's Soviet Union travel, I've discussed this in some detail in uh, the first chapter of my book, you know, how enthusiastic he was uh, during and after his travel to the Soviet Union, his interaction with the top Soviet leaders and how he wanted to propagate a form of socialism in India. 
so there is evidence from all of this that he attempted to engage with Marxist politics. Uh, but then there is little or nothing to suggest that he intellectually engaged with anarchist thinkers or with anarchism in general. And likewise, anarchism was not of any major political significance in South India in his time. Um, likewise, uh, another point of uh, difference between Periyar and the anarchists is that uh, where the anarchists were opposed to the use of the state for even a transitional situation, Periyar had a very cautious approach to the state and he did not give a call for its immediate abolition. Periyar's utopia of the future, uh, he writes it in uh, this uh, tract called Inivaru Mulagam, written in 1944, which uh, translates to this world to come. Uh, he outlines his utopia as a stateless society, which does not have uh, capitalism or caste or religion or gender-based oppression and so on. In the contemporary, when he was operating, he fought for greater rights for the subaltern caste, especially with regards to proportional representation within the ambits of the existing Indian state. So over here, one might perhaps find similarities to the strategies of state socialism and anarchism. But the purpose of the book is to show that there is much in the essence of Periyar's political thought to suggest a greater affinity with anarchist thinking, especially with regard to religion and social power. In essence, I'm arguing, Periyar's works reveal his greater interest in the unmasking of power rather than in replacing it with anything akin to a Soviet-style dictatorship of the proletariat. My argument as such is that Periyar's critique of political theology was a lot closer to anarchism than to Marxism. Now, Bakunin, Mikhail Bakunin, the uh, famed uh, Russian anarchist thinker, believed that the state and religion were bonded in an unholy marriage that prevented the emancipation of the poor and the working classes, keeping them in a state of subservience. Periyar, while not explicitly anti-statist like Bakunin, nevertheless saw the Indian state as a hurdle for the emancipation of the Dalits and the intermediate caste. Periyar argued that the Indian state and the Brahmins worked together to keep the lower caste in a state of permanent subservience. But he does this without supporting an alternate nationalism or a nation-state formation. Periyar's grudge against state power, if one might say that, was that the Indian nation state privileged the Brahmins and condemned the intermediate caste and the Dalits to being in the state of shudrahut and untouchability. He claimed that not just by religion, but even by secular law, non-Brahmins who were in the Hindu fold, including rationalists and atheists, were treated as shudras. He accused religion and law in general for gender biased moral prescriptions, which privileged men and curtailed the liberties of women. The seeds of modern Tamil atheism laid by secular thinkers of the 19th century, like Atipakam Venkatachala Nayaka, found their full germination in the thoughts and works of Periyar Ivi Ramasam. However, it was not just a rejection of religion. Periyar's anti-Brahmanism, I argue, was a political atheism that sought to critique, demystify, and dismantle the political theology of Brahmanism. Periyar believed that an elite class in India stood in the way of the law of equality. This elite class, the Brahmins mainly, used the Hindu religion to ensure their superiority in society and the state. He argued that the state was an instrument to cement the superiority of the upper caste. M.S. Aspandian, for instance, details how Periyar used the dominant narrative of Hinduism as shaped by Orientalist scholarship 
and native Brahmin intellectuals to conflate Hinduism with Aryanism and Brahminism. Periyar saw religion as an institution of social power that privileged the Brahmins as an elite caste group to the detriment of equality and liberty of women and caste lower in the Hindu hierarchy. Periyar located the oppression of these groups not merely in class terms like Mikhail Bakunin, but also with respect to their marginalized identities. He believed that Hinduism was incapable of self-reform and only its removal could once and for all eradicate casteism. So as I referred to this pam uh, pamphlet called Inivaru Mulagam, this world to come, he believed that science and rationality would displace God and that the West, he was referring to the Soviet Union, was setting an example of such a society. Along with God, states, war, money, slavery, and oppression of women would also end, and there would be a universal community where the oppression of any would provoke the indignation of all. To Periyar, God was a relic from the barbaric times, which had been adapted by the Brahmins to perpetuate their dominance. But Periyar also says, and I quote him, people say that there is an omnipotent and omnipresent God but I'm not calling for his abolition. I'm only calling for the abolition of that God who approves and strengthens the caste order. One of the key obstacles in the journey towards Periyar's utopia were the Hindu religionists who were mired in superstition and an admiration for mythical past. He saw the campaign for rationalism as a vital challenge to the Hindu religionists and to empower the lower caste. In his words, and I quote him, what I'm doing is not political work, but a work for rationalism. Rationalism must spread among the people. Rationalism must be taught to those people who have been brutally oppressed and they must be humanized. Rationalism to Periyar was the life of humanity and this life was denied to the lower caste by the Brahmins, God, religion, and the scriptures. Periyar says, and I quote him, the rationalist must have no belief in God, no belief in religion. They should have no attachment to God, religion, country, or language. They should not care for ancestor worship. To Periyar, such attachments were learned and thus could be unlearned. And he urged that only the, the only attachment for rationalist should be the progress of humanity. So Periyar was critical of both Brahmins and non-Brahmins who upheld the Hindu religion. He argued that the imitation of Brahmin practices has resulted in the degrading and the enslaving of womankind. And he called for the end of such traditions. He routinely condemned the epics and the Puranas for the degradation of women. Locating the evil of misogyny and casteism in the Hindu gods, he called for their abolition. Echoing Mikhail Bakunin's rejoinder to Voltaire. So Voltaire had famously said, if God does not exist, uh, it is necessary to invent him. So Bakunin's rejoinder was that if God exists, it is necessary to abolish him. So echoing a sort of a similar sentiment, Periyar says, it is said, that God created untouchability. If that is true, the first thing to do would be to abolish such a God. If God is unaware of this cruel practice, then he should be abolished sooner. If he was unable to prevent this injustice or stop the unjust, then he has no business to exist. Periyar argued that nasty Tamil equivalent of atheism got a bad name because of the force of religious traditions that successfully criminalized atheism and free thinking. In the early 1930s, he greatly appreciated the mushrooming of atheist associations in the West and wanted similar groups to em emerge in South India. To Periyar, atheism and attacks on established religions were an indication of social progress in history. 
interestingly he saw religious figures like jesus christ uh, the buddha and muhammad as progressives of their times whereas atheists like darwin marx and lenin were progressive of theirs for instance he says that uh, christ and muhammad who said that there were not a thousand gods but only one were rationalists of their times but in contemporary times saying that there was no god was the only true rationalism according to him echoing lenin he was convinced that atheism was necessary for the propagation of socialist thought however he was also of the opinion that atheism and rationalism alone would not make an egalitarian society at one place he says that for india to prosper not only does it need atheism but also unconditional support for women's liberation likewise reminiscing on his travel to paris he noted the differences between the atheist groups of the working class and that of the bourgeoisie so perrier's concern was not that atheism be adopted as a philosophy but that it be turned to productive social uses he asserts perrier must real perrier asserts that people must realize their own strength and gain self mastery to reject the oppressive structures of religion caste and gender oppression and live as liberated individuals priyar understands rationalism as a faculty to reason why things are bad and to explore how they can be better while he does hold rationalism as an enemy of theology he also posits it as a critique of secular problems to priyar those countries where there are inequalities where people are discontented discontented because of inequalities where there is the problem of selfish private competition in such places there will not be full rationalism rationalism and atheism to periyar are not end goals they are means for a critical interrogation of existing power structures periyar saw rationalism to be intertwined with revolution this made periyar's atheism a political atheism that did not restrict itself to a mere rejection of or disbelief in god but a critical opposition to social political moral and philosophical systems that mystified the oppressive conditions in which humanity existed the task of political atheism was to demystify these along with religions now i also want to highlight over here what was periyar's difference with the communist with whom he was some time a co traveler and many times a critic as well and why i would prefer to read him in the anarchist tradition right uh, so after his tour in the soviet union periyar began aggressively promoting socialist ideas arranging for the translation of marxist texts to tamil denouncing nationalism and hailing the virtues of proletarian internationalism after consultations with local communists the self respecters passed a set of resolutions demanding radical land reforms minimal wages improving of living conditions for workers public ownership of essential services state control of religious bodies and prohibition of caste apprehensive of the radicalization of the self respect movement the colonial government began a crackdown on its leaders and cadres and many including periyar had to serve terms in prison fearing that the progress made by the self respect movement would achieve severe setbacks under continued repression periyar made a break with his erstwhile communist allies even though he would be attracted to socialist ideals for the rest of his life but there was another crucial reason for his distancing from the indian communists Selig Harrison observes that the communists won at several places in Tamil Nadu in the 1951 elections owing largely to support from Periyar's DK but they were not on the same ground on many issues most notably the caste question and the national question 
Periyar, Selig Harrison says, was strongly critical of Brahmin preponderance in Tamil communist leadership and believed that a consequence of this was, and I quote Harrison, Tamil communist subservience to North Indian domination, not to mention the bypassing of the problem of caste. To Periyar, the most complete expression of political Brahminism was nationalism, and he, feel, and he felt that the Indian communists uncritically celebrated nationalism and took no account of its religious and caste basis. In an article written in 1944 titled Communism or Common Rights, What Should Come First, Periyar prioritizes common rights. Noting that the Indian Communist Party was dominated by caste elites, he argued of communism would only benefit the Brahmins, since a mere change in economic status would not necessarily bring a change in ritual hierarchy. He mockingly referred to the Indian communists as communist devotees, much like how Bakunin dubbed the European communists as fervent believers. And Periyar criticized them for taking, for failing to take a clear stand on caste and ritual hierarchies. Contrasting with the Soviet Union, Periyar said, since the Western countries did not have caste, they had to wage a class war before communism could be reached. Here, owing to the presence of caste, it is necessary to wage a caste war before achieving communism. Periyar differentiates between caste and class in that class is determined by relation to labor, whereas caste is a marker determined by birth in relation to a religiously sanctioned hierarchy. He asserts, and I quote him, in a country where there are no common rights, communism would only strengthen those who have been enjoying greater rights, adding that the abolishing of the privilege of the upper caste would result in going halfway towards the communist ideal. Not only did subaltern caste need to reject Hinduism, but even for the struggles of the poor and the working class for equality and communism, Brahmanism had to be challenged first. At a speech in 1953, Periyar candidly says, and I quote him in detail, I'm not against communism or socialism. I have more commitment and interest in communism and socialism than others. But we must have a communism and socialism that is adapted to this country's needs. Unless and until the superiority of the Brahmins and Brahmanism, which are most powerful and are fundamentally opposed to socialism or communism, are abolished in this country, communism or socialism cannot form here. Instead, only Brahmanism will get strengthened." End quote. In March 1973, six months before his death, Periyar asserted that social equality was as important as perhaps even a prerequisite for economic equality, and that those who believe in socialism should work for a social revolution and the annihilation of caste. He sensed that the Indian communists not only failed to challenge Brahmanism, but often ended up as apologists for the same. Periyar suspected that the universality that was guaranteed by communism in the Indian scenario would be appropriated by the upper caste to secure their own particular interests. In this, he was not rejecting the universality of communism. He was rather criticizing the upper caste for being unable to transcend their particularity. But equally, he was apprehensive that the Marxist dogma functioned as yet another mantra for the Indian elite caste to capture and retain power while maintaining the ritual hierarchy. So my interpretation in this book as such is that despite his fascination for the Soviet Union, which was a sort of a lifelong fascination, but he was quite about the prospects of a in India without going through a period of radical social reform. Now, where Bakunin 
expected that the Marxist variant of socialism would inevitably lead to the dictatorship of a theoretically sophisticated elite over the masses, Periyar accused the Indian Marxist movement of being dominated by the priestly class. And to Periyar, without this social reform, communism in India would be a dictatorship of a priestly class. Another crucial difference from the communists was Periyar's approach to organizational politics. Periyar asserts that Dravida Karagam is not a political party. It is a party to do with society. I have always maintained that politics is an aspect of society, end quote. Periyar expresses his criticism of the idea that society can be changed by capturing political power. On the contrary, he considers political power as a hindrance to social reform. He instead believes that functioning as a pressure group, working with people for social causes, can enable his movement to compel those in power to implement favorable policies. The anarchist thinker John Holloway favors the idea of power to over power over. The former power to represents the social capacity of col for collective action, while the latter power over represents the exercise of coercion over society. Periyar clearly favors the idea of power too, where he argues that his intention is not capturing state power, but mobilizing society to ensure that the state was kept in check and that the people got their due. While Periyar desires that the state will be abolished in the future, unlike the Bakuninists, he does not act immediately to abolish the same. His organizational strategy was to hold politics accountable to society by his emphasis on increasing collective social consciousness. More specifically, the subaltern community's power to change things rather than a vanguard capturing power over society. Periyar says, and I quote him, we do not want political power, only the power to think. So Periyar's political atheism, to sum it up, was a critique of all forms of established power. While he believed in the importance of samatvam, which translates to equality, and samadharmam, which is a neologism of Periyar, uh, uh, the Tamil equivalent of socialism, it was coupled with the stress that he placed on vidudalai, freedom. So Samatvam and Samadharmam were incomplete without Vidudalai. That is, equality and socialism were incomplete without freedom. This was freedom from social, economic, religious, political forms of oppression and hierarchy, and also freedom towards achieving self-mastery and individuality. Periyar saw the dominant religion in India and the Indian state and its apparatus like law, education, police, press, and the others to be tainted by Brahmanism. Though at different points of time in his life, he viewed communism or conversions to other religions to be options to fight Brahmanism, he did not believe in substituting one form of power for the another. He saw approaches that concentrated power in the hands of a few whether they be priests or an elitist vanguard, to be harmful for the many. His critique of the political theology of Brahmanism was a multi-pronged attack on what he thought to be the multiple manifestations of Brahmanism in both religious and secular spheres. He identified Hinduism to be the main religious, theological form of Brahmanism and the state and its institutions to be the secular form. During certain political utterances, some of Periyar's approaches might seem inconsistent. For instance, his statement that communism shared the common goals of major religions, or his support for the Congress ruled state during the rule of uh, uh, Kamaraja. But underlying these, 
the essence of Periyar's text, strongly suggests that his persistent critique of secularized theological concepts, his opposition to both God and the state, indicate a sort of a positioning of Periyar within a sort of an anarchist tradition. So, do, can I wind up now? Is it good? Have you, have you finished or you want yeah, yeah, yeah. to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've addressed most of the main points which I wanted to say. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, it was great listening to you. And uh, I like the way you have presented that how uh, Periyar was uh, projected in some of uh, prominent scholar that he concentrate on less important issues um, than the social and um, political issues, which, which were necessary to address at that time. And then how he shared um, some similarities uh, with Marxism and socialism. And, but I really think it's a new perspective you brought that he was not only against uh, uh, the God religious uh, theological, but the state secular theologies. Uh, first. But uh, I think, I, think um, I need to read uh, your book uh, because I think one hour is not uh, enough. And uh, it seems, uh, uh, that's not very convincing, I will say, the argument there shouldn't be more uh, 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 because there are, you you himself cited that there, there are the example which suggests uh, that he, uh, he wanted to work, uh, he supported Kamraj uh, government and wanted to work uh, with state. And the, another problem is your formulation. I find that if uh, there is no state, there is no religion, then what is the way he wanted to organize the society, uh, human body? Is it anarchist of kind of Gandhian kind that uh, every enlightened rational people uh, will able to organize their life and society uh, without any power? Uh, is it a utopian for which he was looking for or or or, or there was uh, some stages through which uh, this uh, 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 this utopian state we can reach uh, he suggested and proposed uh, i thought uh, 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 i missed uh, the last sentence of yours i, I was telling uh, can the society by abolishing the state and uh, religion can automatically transfer transform in such a stage or he proposed there are some intermediate stages through which the society will go through and uh, he has some plan and all that uh, uh, if such the case uh, and i also find one thing uh, very amazing that you said uh, he he said he did not want to capture the state and he wanted to remain as a pressure group and to uh, so so there are just for curiosity I, I was wondering how it the formulation will work um, means in place of pressurizing if you have the state in your hand you can do the same thing so what is the need for pressurizing state and doing uh, so, but later you you said that because it is he was the against the state. Uh, that's why there was the philosophical difference for taking the state in hand. Or, uh, but if you wanted to do the thing, uh, sorry, work done by the state, then it is better to take state in hand. So, uh, I hope I made uh, my, yeah. my clear. If you can clarify this thing, uh, or I can take some few more question and then you can respond to them can i first respond to you yeah, yeah please sure. yeah yeah thank you so much uh, so nishikan regarding uh, uh, if he has got a plan or a blueprint right so uh, there's something which i start off in uh, begin with in uh, the first chapter of my book is that uh, perrier is not a theorist right so uh, you know there are some of his perrier supporters who want to project him as a theorist or as a uh, 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 a coherent philosopher, but I don't think uh, uh, he was ever that, right? Because uh, uh, he was more of a man of uh, uh, direct action 
and most of his writings and speeches are connected to a certain particular problem he was facing at an immediate point of time so there's actually very few occasions in his uh, entire corpus of writings where he is uh, trying to reflect upon any particular problem in a you know a rigorous theoretical sense and provide a sort of a meta framework if uh, one were to say so in fact uh, i would say the only sort of coherent book which periyar wrote in his time was this uh, pamphlet called uh, penyen adimayanal or why women were in uh, pamphlet which periyar wrote in his time which tries to analyze the oppression of women and suggest possible ways of uh, uh, liberation but other than that regarding uh, state power regarding caste regarding uh, uh, religion or nationalism periyar has not produced uh, theoretical uh, 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 you know uh, monographs which we can uh, take for immediate reference and say that this is a periyarist theory but having said that it is also my argument that his writings and speeches nevertheless form uh, a sizable uh, and voluminous uh, 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 stuff to theorize what his position on uh, state on nationalism on religion and so on and so forth can be by trying to arrive at a sort of an uh, uh, an essence or a core of his uh, writings um now regarding the state and uh, his plan for the state as such uh there is this sort of a short pamphlet which i referred to which uh, he wrote in 1944 which is called this world to come in tamil it is called inivaru mulagam so over there uh he is just more or less subscribing to the idea of a global uh, working class revolution right more or less but he believes that in the indian specific case it will happen as a revolution of the oppressed non brahmin uh, communities who would uh, uh, you know come together and overthrow and have a sort of a socialist form of government but he does not specify what is this form of government so he does not say uh, make any claims on whether this will be a dictatorship whether this will be a dictatorship of the oppressed class or anything of that sort so he just says very sort of loosely that uh, uh, looking at the way in which revolutions are happening in other parts of the world such revolutions uh, could happen and should happen in a country like india which would uh, which requires the uh, transgressing of caste boundaries and which will also lead to the annihilation of uh, caste boundaries but uh, this is again this document is not a blueprint it is uh, still a sort of a sort of a utopian vision of what periyar believes the world will be like or what the world should be like uh, tomorrow um he does not really give a sort of a very specific clear program on what to do and uh, uh, how this will lead to uh, a higher state of society which actually relates to your Uh, next major point why not just capture state power instead of putting pressure on it is that periyar believed that capturing state power would necessarily lead to a compromise with the dominant ideological uh, power namely that of uh, brahmanism so for instance he uh, tells i mean his, he says uh, at different points of time in his career you know whether he is supporting uh, uh, kamarajar or whether he is supporting anna durai or whether he is supporting karnanidhi you know all of these were chief ministers of tamil nadu even while supporting them he tells that uh, all of these uh, political leaders are limited by the positions which they hold right they cannot uh, criticize uh, religion or social practices with the sort of uh, freedom which periyar has right so uh, periyar says that he uh, needs or a social reform movement needs this sort of a freedom to be constantly critical of any and all forms of social power while a position within the uh, politi- uh, within the state 
would necessarily entail a sort of a compromise with the, the prevailing social and religious power. So Periyar believed that instead, acting from outside the ambits of the state and trying to pressure the state or create and increase social consciousness was a better way of uh, 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 bringing about the rationalist society that he saw as a, a you know a, a, a desirable end goal. Okay, thank you. So, if there is question, okay, one, two. Uh, so the, thank you, Karthik, for for a wonderful presentation. My name is Abhendra Sharan. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, intellectually uh, what is at stake for you. Uh, in terms of this division between socialism and anarchism. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, obviously from what you've said, there's a great fascination for socialism globally, but a deep dissatisfaction with actually existing communism in India uh, for its Brahmanical roots. Uh, and similarly, as you're responding to the question of state, there is a dissatisfaction with a state that is necessarily compromised with Brahmanism. But I believe that you can, through radical pressure, you can bring about changes, some of which may be through the state, some of which may be within the society. So I'm still trying to grasp, given this complexity and given that you're saying that he's not a systematic thinker, what is at stake for you as an intellectual to put such a sharp theoretical reading on Peria? Is he a socialist? Is he an anarchist? It's almost like you're asking for a political philosophical question, having said that he's not a theorist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see, my, uh, my, my stake as such, I mean, I would say uh, 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 one of the key aims of my research project has, uh, apart from uh, providing my own take on Periyar, has been to challenge the mistakes on Periyar, right? So which, which I uh, believed uh, offered certain sort of mistaken readings of Periyar, which uh, I don't think finds any sort of validation in his own uh, intellectual uh, genealogy, nor in his, uh, 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 the corpus of his uh, uh, works, right? Um, I, I personally, uh, in my reading of Periyar, what I have found is that, uh, you know, while uh, he does not really aim to be a sort of a coherent uh, theoretician, there are certain uh, aspects of his thought which are consistent from the time he started his political career till his uh, demise in 1973. And one of which I would uh, uh, strongly say is his uh, strong criticisms of any and all forms of established power, right? Which also I believe uh, places him much closer within the anarchist tradition than within the uh, 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 more statist uh, forms of socialism. My contemporary interest in doing this as such is the, uh, the reason uh, trends uh, mainly in uh, parts of uh, uh, Latin America uh, and one could say even in Europe where uh, the old forms of, uh, uh, you know, the Leninist forms of socialism are being challenged and are being replaced or uh, 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 maybe even, even uh, overthrown by more decentralized forms of uh, socialism. I've also been very interested in the Kurdish movement in the Middle East and uh, uh, learning from uh, all of these uh, movements and what they have to offer as alternatives to the socialism of the 20th century. I also somewhere feel that a rereading of Periyar, which is happening in South India at the moment, I would say that uh, it's actually, uh, there's a lot more interest in Periyar now, ever since uh, 2014, uh, than it has uh, ever been at uh, any other point of time in the uh, past. Uh, I, I also think that the sort of new readings of Periyar, which are happening now, uh, it, it would be really sort of good to have this sort of a global, sort of a comparative perspective and to look at these more decentralist 
non-statist uh, forms of socialisms and see how periyarism as a thought and as a possible political practice can fit in. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Ravi Kanji. uh yeah i'm ravi kant i i uh, quite enjoyed the uh, you know uh, the talk uh two three uh, uh, related questions i understand you know uh, this uh, 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 resentment or critique uh, resentment towards a critique of power right uh, is also uh, part of the same story uh, uh, and so the, the, it's it's also about the party right he doesn't like the party, uh, Periyar Saab. So, uh, so it's quite clear, and that that is why uh, now, from your answer to Deepu's question, right, it's clear uh, that uh, there is something else that is going on. So, in that sense, I want to ask you whether you know he his relationship with other people, other socialists or communists of the time, even if they were, you know. Uh, uh, upper caste, Brahmanical, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know his confrontations, for example, his questioning, all of that. You should. Uh, uh, do we have uh, any literature on that? Any correspondence, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So uh, you you want to say something on that? Secondly, I want to you know uh, also understand his position on language, vis-a-vis -vis what is happening. Uh, you know, north versus south. Uh, you know. So where does uh, and 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 the uh, new uh, newly invented kind of Tamil, right, which is anti-Brahmanical or non-Brahmanical at least, if not anti-Brahmanical. So vis-a-vis uh, -vis North, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, you know Tamil itself and Tamil uh, tradition of uh, literary, uh, 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 I mean literature. Yeah, thanks. Hmm. Karthik, you take one more question from Prabhaji. Yeah, uh, but can I answer one by one? I tend to lose track otherwise. Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay, okay. please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So regarding uh, Peria's relation to the community, uh, uh, as I told in the start of my uh, presentation, there's still a lot of the sort of uh, private correspondence which Peria had with many leaders, which has not yet seen the light of the day. Right. Uh, so uh, we it would it would be a great boon to the intellectual history of South India or the Dravidian movement, whatever, if we could have access to the correspondences which he had uh, with his uh, 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 confidant for a long time, Mr. S. Ramanathan, who was a who was Peria's co-traveler and who also accompanied with him on his uh, Soviet trips and so on. Uh, likewise, Periyar's correspondence with the other sort of uh, uh, communist leaders of his time, Jivanandam, uh, Singara Veller and so on, might uh, reveal uh, a, a different sort of a, a aspect of uh, Periyar's uh, relationship uh, to these leaders and the movements which they led. Uh, but then again, if we are to go by the sort of uh, political positions and the explicit political statements, uh, 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 speeches, uh, articles which he has written, uh, it does appear that Periyar always wanted to sort of cultivate a camaraderie between his movement and the communist movement, but at several points of time in history was let down by them, which or he at least felt uh, let down by them. So I'll just give one example, right? You know, um, uh, 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 this this incident often, unfortunately, is not even remembered uh, that much by uh, the massacre of uh, the communists in, uh, I forget the jail, I think it could be the Salem uh, jail in 1951, soon after uh, India's independence under Rajaji's uh, Chief Ministership. Now, one of the very few rare voices who uh, raised this, uh, 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 you know, a protest against this massacre was Peria, right? So he strongly condemned this atrocity. He called it a sort of a fascist uh, sort of an atrocity and uh, 
you know, uh, criticize the government for its uh, extreme high handedness in dealing with the leftists and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, very soon after, even though the communists were basking in uh, the support of uh, Periyar and the self respect movement, um, they were also simultaneously branding Periyar and the self respecters as anti nationals and separatists. Right. So this was a sort of a big letdown uh, for uh, Periyar, you know. So while uh, he was uh, condemning uh, the Tamil Nadu government for uh, its excessive force against the communists, you had the communists raising slogans like, uh, you know, Kekade, Kekade, Dravid and Nade Kekade, basically means that don't demand, don't demand, don't ever demand for uh, Dravid and Nadu. Right. So uh, this, this sort of a, uh, 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 what shall I say, non-reciprocal uh, affection, which Periyar had for the communists, eventually led to much more stronger frictions and uh, sort of a complete fallout. And uh, likewise, it has, uh, 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 um, due to several factors, uh, the communists were often found themselves on the opposite side where Periyar was on. Right. For instance, uh, in in the sort of uh, 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 the political climate created after the Mudukalatur uh, riots of the 1950s, when the Kamaraj uh, government arrested uh, the person who was considered to be one of the key figures of the riots, uh, Mr. Muthuramalinga Deva, the communists were supporting uh, Muthuramalinga Deva, while Periyar was. Uh, support, uh, you know, while Periyar was supporting the Kamaraj government in the arrest of Muthuramalinga Devar, because he believed that this gentleman was responsible for caste riots in South Tamil Nadu. So these were, these are just some of the key sort of incidents where they, the communists and Periyar, uh, Periyar has found themselves on polar opposite positions. And uh, uh, which is why Periyar, you know, always took care to maintain that he always has sympathy for some form of socialism, but he has no uh, faith as such in the uh, 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 Indian communists as such to solve the social problems of India. On the language issue, uh, uh, I mean, Bernard Bate has this uh, remarkable work called, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, the Tamil oratory and the Dravidian aesthetic, where he uh, gives uh, Periyar considerable credit for plebeianizing the Tamil uh, political language, right? Because uh, until Periyar, uh, Tamil was generally spoken in a very archaic and in a very ornate uh, way. Whereas uh, Periyar made it as a sort of a more uh, easily communicable sort of a language, which was coarse, uh, sometimes vulgar, but uh, always in a very sort of a, a, a casual and spoken Tamil. Uh, mainly because Periyar did not have any big fascination for uh, 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 celebrating one's own language over the other, right? So he tells at several points of time, his own, the only reason why he opposes Hindi is because this will practically and materially affect the non-Hindi speaking population and not because Tamil is supposed to be a great or an old language. In fact, at one place, he even says, if uh, you are claiming that it's, uh, you know, he is mocking the Tamil nationalists. He says that uh, if you claim that your language is old, you should probably put it in the dustbin because that's what we do to old and uh, outdated things, right? This is actually, this is the reason why uh, along with the, uh, the Hindu, right? The Tamil nationalists also have a huge... Uh, 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 grudge against uh, Periyar. So uh, his his uh, language politics as such was that uh, we must, each region must develop its own very uh, uh, accessible and democratic language, but not a sort of a take a, any sort of linguistic pride or chauvinism. So that was his overall position on uh, language. Prabhatji, please. Uh, I have a very uh, pointed uh, uh, thing to ask. Uh, it's more in the spirit of clarification, if you could give. Uh, 
I mean, uh, after listening to your lecture and then the your extensive and quite satisfying answers, uh, what crossed in my mind is that Periyar is, I mean, what is the self-image of Periyar as such? Uh, I mean, the self-image in a sense that whether he sees uh, himself as a politician, whether he sees himself as a ascetic renunciator standing outside, but who knows inside out, who's familiar with everything and has an advantage, moral advantage, political advantage and all sorts of things. So, because there are people who, uh, there are works which, deal, I mean, Gandhi, the ascetic, the philosopher, outsider and so on and so forth. And then this, you can interpret whether it, it's a new kind of anarchism. I mean, because, uh, I mean, that's, I'm not uh, unhappy with the way you approach because at the heart of it, uh, you have this uh, self-conscious decision that you don't impose uh, the preformed category and do the deficit analysis that whether he is adequately uh, anarchist or socialist and so forth, what he is that you are trying to trace. So where does that figure of renunciator uh, or if at all that works? Because in most of the cases, and it's not certainly Brahmanical. Renunciator is anti-Brahmanical, a non-Brahmanical, all kinds of uh, traditions we have in the local genealogy uh, in South Asia as such. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, how, how does uh, Periyar see himself? I mean, uh, I will rather use his own words before going into mine. So he says, and I quote him, I am a reformer of the human society. I do not care about country, God, religion, language, or the state. I am only concerned about the welfare and growth of the human society, end quote. So he views himself as such, as a uh, social reformer and an activist primarily. Right? So in a sense, he's, you could say that he is also acting as a renunciator because he has... Uh, renounced what he uh, criticizes as the craving of people who enter public life, namely political power, right? And uh, there is a corresponding term in uh, uh, Tamil for this, namely Turavi, which means the person who has given up, right? So there are some people who look at Periyar as a sort of a, 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 a secular Turavi or a secular uh, renunciator of uh, power and of uh, position as such. Um, in fact, uh, uh, as, as you likely, uh, rightly said, there are other sorts of uh, uh, non-Brahmanical, perhaps even anti-Brahmanical traditions uh, of, of uh, uh, renunciation. Uh, uh, one of the very common example which comes to mind from the South Indian case is that of the Siddhars who were sort of uh, wandering ascetics who preached uh, spirituality but also mocked the authority of uh, rituals, of caste, of uh, idol worship, of uh, 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 you know, uh, Vedic practices and so on and so forth. And uh, one could possibly definitely read uh, Periyar in this sort of a uh, you know, socio-historical, cultural uh, tradition. And I do hint upon that as well in my, uh, uh, the first chapter of my book. So yes, uh, definitely, definitely. I, I would uh, uh, see or uh, like uh, to uh, look at an engagement uh, with Periyar as a sort of a political renunciator. Yes. Thank you. If there is a question from screen, anyone want to ask may raise uh, his or her hand, we may allow them to ask or otherwise we will wind up. Okay, so I, it seems there is no question. Okay, thank you, Karthik. It was really very fresh to listen to your very fresh new thoughts and new way of interpreting Periyam. Uh, I would like to thank our director for his guidance.
Sachin, Ayodhya, and Praveen ji for the support, and Vikant ji and Prabhat ji and uh, Rakesh ji for attending, and other who are, who attended online and Facebook. So I thanks everyone for uh, attending the seminar and. Once again, thanks, Karthik, for accepting our invitation and for giving me. Thank you. So we may now part. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really had a great time and uh, looking forward to talking soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye.